I'm going to start off with the Medrash Tanchuma, which is in Pasha's Noach, which actually talks about Noach and alcoholism. And it's a very fascinating Medrash about the first person in this world that actually got drunk. The Medrash says the following. Noach came out of the Teva. The world was totally destroyed. It was very painful to come back to a world where he had no friends, there were no humans. And the first thing he did was he planted a grape vine. And the Medrash says that this vine actually came from Gan Eden, and therefore the minute he planted it, it grew, it ripened, and he was able to make wine. So the story goes like this. When Noach went out of the table to, build, to plant this vineyard, the Satan came to him. And stood in front of him. The Satan said to Noach, What are you planting? Of course the Satan knew what he was planting. But he asked him, what are you planting? I'm alone, Kerem. I'm planting a vineyard. I'm alone, the Satan said to Noach, Mativo. What's, what's so special about, about this vineyard? Like, why is this the first thing you're doing? I'm alone, Mesukim. The fruit, the grape, is very sweet. Ben Lachem Ben Yevashim, whether it's a raisin, dried, or a grape. It's very sweet. And from these grapes, you make wine. And here is where he made the biggest mistake. And he told the Satan, I am in a bad place. I came out of this teva, and the world is destroyed. Do you know why I planted a vineyard? Because do you know what wine does? Wine makes you happy. Wine can take away the pain. The Satan said back to Noach, Bo, come. I want to be a partner in alcohol. I want to be your partner in this vineyard. I'm alone. Noah answered the Satan, L'chaim. I'm reading you a Medrash Tanchuma. L'chaim. Cheers. Mel Asa Satan. What did the Satan do? This is an amazing Medrash Tanchuma. Everything is in the Torah, as it says in Pirkei Avos. Everything that we've learned, whether you're a therapist or a rabbi, it doesn't make a difference. Everything that we've ever learned, you'll find in the Torah. Listen to what the Medrash says. Heavy kevesh v'hargoi tachas ha'gefen. The Satan came and he took a lamb and he killed it. And he let the blood of the lamb run into the vines, the grapevines. Achakach, he came back. Heavy Ari, he brought a lion. Hargu, he killed it. And he let the blood of the lion feed the vines. Ba'akakach, heavy Chazir, he brought a pig. Hargo, and he killed it. And he let the blood go into the vines. Ba'akakach, heavy Kaif. And the fourth animal he brought was a monkey. Hargo, and he killed it. Tachashakerem, and he let the blood go into the vines. And the, the blood soaked into this vineyard. And it grew from the blood. Why did he do this? Why did the Satan do this? Listen carefully. Before you start to drink, before you take that first drink, you're like a lamb. You don't know anything. You don't under, even understand when they share your wool, when they take stuff away from you. Yet everything is okay. 
So a person, when he drinks a little bit, eh, nothing happened. Shasa kohaygen, that's when you drink normal. But then, when you begin to drink a little bit more, harihu gibor ka'ari. The second animal he shechted was a lion. Alcohol will take you from being totally unfit socially. You can't talk to anyone. You don't get along with anyone. You start to drink. You get inhibited. All of a sudden, you're sitting at the bar. You're talking. You got friends. You're at a wedding. You drank enough. Now you can dance because until then, you didn't feel part of the wedding. So the Ari, the, the blood of the Ari, put in the power of the alcohol of the grape, the power to make you feel like someone you're not. But that doesn't last long. Because you really know that I'm not an Ari. Well, I'm an Inkamaisha Bailam. You start walking around saying, I'm the only, there's no one like me in the world. Keep it Shashasa Yasa as you begin to drink more. You become like a chazir, says the Medjish Tan Chumam. You soil your clothing. You are no longer, because we're going to talk about today, that addiction doesn't really fix anything. So you started off, you drank, and now you felt good about yourself. But you really know that you're not a lion. So you drink more because what happens very often in sports it's an interesting thing about addiction also. So a lot of the guys who won the Super Bowl, and they, they got to the top of the game, they got to the, the plateau of, of, of a football player is to win the Super Bowl. And they got their ring. And, and Chicago is, they're having marches and floats, and you're in the top of your game, and you're doing newscasts. But you know what? Four, six, eight weeks after that, the football season's over. No one's talking about football anymore. And the football player realizes that his whole dream was that what's going to make me the happiest person in the world? When I win that Super Bowl and I get that ring, I am going to be the happiest guy in the world. So that gets you through life because you have this dream and you're marching to the Super Bowl. But then all of a sudden you get to the Super Bowl and you get your ring and two years or five years later, you're a nobody, you retire from football. These guys are all killing themselves. Half of them are in jail. They're selling their rings online. What happened? They thought that that would be paradise. They got there and realized it's not paradise. As the rabbi spoke about before me, there's such a void that I thought this was going to do it for me. If this doesn't do it for me, then nothing's going to do it for me. That's a huge problem. The grass is greener on the other side, but when you get to the other side and the grass isn't greener, you got a problem. So when you drink, in the beginning you feel, Psh, it's doing something for me. When you come to the realization, I'm not a lion because I drink. It's an outside source. It's not changing who I am. When I wake up from being drunk, I'm the same miserable guy. So then you begin to drink more. Because at this point, you're in pain because you realize that what you thought's going to help you is not helping you. So you begin to drink more. And you begin to drink more often. And as the Medjitan Humer finishes, he says, you drink so much that you dance like a monkey on the bar. And everybody's laughing at you. But at least they're giving me attention. Even if they're laughing at me, I'm still getting some attention. So the first alcoholic was Noah. And what happened to him in the end, because he drank, we know what happened, what his son Chum did. And I, I have spoken to people who drink. I have friends that drink. And I'm like, Noah ish tzaddik hoyabidayraisov. The Pasha begins that Noah was the tzaddik in his door, and Rashi is a machlokish, but he learns that his whole door was miserable and he still was good. Noah is tzaddik. The Torah doesn't say witness on anybody that he was an ish tzaddik 
Noach ish tzaddik. And where did he end up? He ended up, ladies and gentlemen, cursing his own child. You can go from where the Torah says witness that you're a tzaddik to a place that you curse your own child. And I tell my friends who are drinkers, you're not Noach. And the Torah is not saying witness that you're an ish tzaddik. How sure are you that you won't hurt your own children when you're drunk? This is an opening Medrash Tanchuma in Pasha's Noach. What a lesson for all of us. The Satan is a partner in alcohol. That partnership was made with Noach a long, long time ago. And the mistake, the point of mistake that Noach made when he told the Satan, wine makes you happy. The Satan said, really? Good. If that's the case, I want to be part of that. So that's the first point that I want to make. The Kava Yashar was written 350 years ago. An amazing sefer with 102 chapters. He tells a story about addiction and keys. In the Perak 25, in the 25th chapter of the Kava Yosher, it's written in English. I was part of having it written in English because it's such an important sefer. He tells a story, it's a very amazing story. I'm going to tell it to you very fast. There's a machlokas, there's a whole argument, and we've shown him if the story is true or it's not true, because there's certain halachas that we learn in Hilchas Brismila from this story. And he says the following story. He says there was a man who lived in a town. The man was a miser. He could not give a penny to charity. He didn't come to shul on Monday and Thursday, because that's when the poor people came collecting. He would not give a penny. He was a multimillionaire. But one thing he did, he was a mile. And anyone who needed a bris milah, he would do for free. That was his chesed. Money I'm not giving you, but if you need a bris milah, he would do it for free. So one day, a man comes to him, tall, beautiful looking man, and he says, I need you to do a bris milah for my son. It's a two days traveling to where I am. It's in the middle of a forest. Would you do it? He said, sure, he took his bris milah kit. He said, 100%, no problem. Okay, so he comes to this beautiful, beautiful town. And the man drops him off by the house, and he goes into the house, and he meets the, he wants to look at the baby to see if the baby's yellow, if he can do a bris milah. And he walks into the room where the wife is, is, is laying. And she says to him the following, she says to him, you don't know what you just walked into. My husband who came to get you is a shindalad. He's not a human being. He's a shade, which were created right before Shabbos. And the famous story of Ashmedai, who had webbed feet. That's the one thing they can't change, but they're changelings. And my husband is a shindalad, and this whole town are devils, are these shindalids. You're in big trouble. And the one rule you need to know is that if you take anything from them, if they give you something and you take it, you belong to them. So whatever he offers you, do not take it. Okay? So he comes back. I'll read it to you from inside. She says, He's a changeling, he's a devil. But I'm human, says the woman. When I was young, the Shadim kidnapped me. I'm lost. And this is where all the halachas talks about 
if a woman, a, a, a human woman has a child, are they chayv and bris? And they bring this whole story as a raya that they are chayv and bris. Whatever. I'm not going to get into the whole lachas of it. Anyway, so she warns him. Okay? For he is Erev. It comes in the evening. There's a big party in the house. The Vachnacht. All the shade them come. They all look like human beings. And he's sitting there, the moil, and they're like, the Vachnacht, the moil has to eat. Have something to eat. But he knows if he eats something, it belongs to them. So he says, it was a long trip. I don't feel well. I need to go to sleep. I can't, I can't stay by the Vachnacht. And he goes to sleep. Next day, he does the bris. And they make the party of the bris milah. And... They say, you got to wash, you got to eat from the bris. And he says, I had a very terrible dream last night. And today I took on a chaloim, a tanas chaloim. I can't eat anything from which, from, I'm sorry, but I'm fasting today. Just do me a favor and take me home. So this head of the, of the shade of this, of this city says to him, okay, but on the way home, I want, we're going to stop at my warehouse. He says, no, I don't need to go. No, he says, you're going to stop at my warehouse. So they come to the warehouse. And he brings him into the first room. He lays Arab, he brings him to the first room. And he brings him into a room that's full of diamonds and gold, as the Gemara says. We know the Gemara that anything that's not counted, that's what they steal. The boats that go to the bottom of the ocean, they steal all that gold and all that silver. So he comes into this room and this, with the shade, and, this, and he sees this unbelievable room with diamonds and gold. And he says, take anything you want. He says, no, I'm a very rich man. I don't give charity, but I'm a very rich man. I don't need your gold. I don't need your silver. He says, okay, let's go into the second room. They go into the second room, and it's full of jewels like he never saw in his life. And he says, how about from this room? He goes, no, I don't want anything from this room either. So he brings him to the third room. When I, when, usually when I tell this to the girls, I say they open the door to the third room, and there's a bunch of human heads hanging there, and they all start crying and screaming, but that's, that's just a joke. It's not really what was in the room. So listen to this. I want to read it to you from inside. So he comes to the third room. The shade asked the moil, I don't need my master. I showed you gold, I showed you silver, I showed you diamonds. And you didn't, it didn't shock you. The third room, you walk in and you turn white and you look like you're going to faint? What did you see in the third room that you look like you're going to faint? These things on the wall are just metal. What were they? It was a room of keys. The he- keys. Keys. Regular keys. The Haitian with a and the moil says, I need my Mia. You want to know why I'm like turning, I turn white and I'm in shock? Shali. Those keys that you have are my keys to my houses, my warehouses, the Khadaram Shali. You have my keys hanging on your wall. They include by the mass mazer, and they're hanging on my keychain. Yo mail of Abalabaya, so the Shindala said to him, Because you did chesed, and you came so far to give my ch- my child a bris. Reisi Shashem he itcha, I see God is with you. Shalaya Khaltav Lashisi, so you didn't eat, you didn't drink, you didn't take anything. He didn't know that his wife warned him. I'll tell you what this room is about. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kavayasha talks about the room of addiction. I am the king of the Shadim. We control certain people. Their nature is to be cheap and miserly. They have given us all their keys. Listen carefully, addiction. They no longer have the strength or the permission to do their own free will. They don't, they don't, the misers don't even have rishus to enjoy 
to buy food or clothing. But since you did this chesed for me, take back your keys. For Altira, don't worry that I'm giving you something because I'm giving you back something that's yours. So therefore, that doesn't put you under our power. He took his keys, he went home. His heart changed. He became a new man. He built a building. He was Malbush Arumim. The Hifle Lassa said, Yo, Moshe, all he did till he died was Chesed, the Nifta, the Shem Tov. What's going on over here? And there's a Rambam on this. Now, let me tell you how addiction works with keys. So, every person has choice. An alcoholic has choice. A drug addict has choice. He's human. He could say no. But he can't say no. He no longer has the key. He no longer has the ability to say no. He lost his Bechira. His keys are hanging in some closet who knows where. So by doing something over and over and over and over and over again, says the Rambam, you lose your choice. He says it in Hilchas Tshuva in the sixth parak that if you do an Avera over and over, what does it mean, Avera, Guerrero, Avera? That if you do it over and over and over, you cannot stop doing it. So the Rambam asks, so what do you do? So what do you do if you're in a hotel and you left your key in the room? Both your keys. What do you do? So downstairs, the manager has a key that opens up every single door in the hotel. As kids, we used to call it a skeleton key. Now they call it a master key. Says the Rambam, if God forbid you lose your keys, there's still a manager of the hotel. And that's God. And if you reach out to God, it's one of the 12 steps to the higher power. And you reach out to God and you pray and you have to make a decision. You see, what, what saved this man, which we're going to talk about, is that even though he didn't give any tzedakah, he had one good thing, and he realized something. And this, if you, if you took any notes of my speech today, this is the most important note you need to take. Why did, the, why did this man who didn't give charity, what changed by walking into that room? What, what he, he threw his keys on the wall? So what? What changed? He's a miser. He doesn't give charity. What changed in his psyche? When he walked out of that room, he went straight back, built yeshivas, gave tzedakah. What changed in that room? Let's, let's, the psychologist in this room, right? Let's go psychologically. What happened in that room? You're a miser. So take your key. You took your key. So what happened? I'll tell you what happened. He thought, as any addict thinks, that it was his choice not to give charity. So I am making a choice. I don't want to help anyone. He walked into the room and saw, I didn't have any choice. I lost my choice. Not that I made a choice not to give money. I don't have a choice anymore. And then this Shindalid gave him back his choice. Wow, you gave me back my choice. Now I can choose. I'm going to give money till I have nothing left in my pockets. What he saw in the room is a switch in a kid's head. The kid thinks, and every addict that I talk to, I don't only work with girls, I work with a lot of boys. Every addict is, Rabbi, when I want to stop, and you've all heard this, I can stop anytime I want. He still thinks he has a choice. He didn't walk into the room yet and see his keys on the wall. So he's thinking, I made a choice to do drugs. I made a choice to drink. I made a choice to gamble. That was my choice. So therefore, if I make a choice to stop, I could do that, am I? I'm like, right, so stop right now. I don't want to right now. Wrong. You don't have a choice anymore, says the Rambam. 
25th parag and Kabbalah Yasha says, darling, you, you lost your choice. Your keys are hanging on a wall somewhere. I'm going to give you back the most precious thing that you could ever have. And that is to you to get back your own choice. That's how the Kavayasha looks at addiction. That's why this is such a big story. You need to make the flip. And whether it's sexual addiction, whatever it is, every single addict says, I still have my choice. I didn't lose my choice. If I want to stop, I could stop. I deal with this all the time. The, 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 the guys who drink every Shabbos and get blitzed and get drunk and come home and they have no Shabbos and they're like, hey, well, Austin, I'm not an addict. How do you know? I don't drink during the week. I still have a choice. See, I, can, I can stop it. And they don't drink during the week. And, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not addicted to cigarettes. I don't smoke on Shabbos. If I was an addict, I'd have to smoke on Shabbos. And I'm not a gambler. Yeah, I go to AC, I play, I play blackjack, I play poker. I don't bet on horses. If I was really an addict, I would bet on horses. Selective addiction. I'm like, can you get, go through a Shabbos without taking a drink 52 weeks a year? No. You lost the power of choice. Can you not gamble at all? No, I got to go to AC once in a while. I'm like, you cannot say no totally. You lost your power of choice. And one of the most important things is in, in tshuva, okay? I'm not going to have that much time to talk about this today. But in tshuva, the first part of tshuva, in Hilchas tshuva, in the Rambam, is vidui. You can't say you're sorry for something you didn't admit. The first, in Judaism, the first part of tshuva is saying, I am an addict. Not, I don't bet on horses, or I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't drink uh, the whole week, but I only drink on Shabbos, or I don't smoke. The first thing is, vidoy. I need a cigarette every 20 minutes all week long. I cannot go a whole week without smoking a cigarette. Okay, so now we know we have a problem. There's a part of your life, there's a part of your brain, there's a part of your psyche that you do not have the key to. So I need to give you back that key. And we're going to talk about how you get back that key. It's sort of a metaphor. I actually spoke about this in Utah to a, a bunch of non-Jewish Mormon therapists. It's sort of a metaphor, so I'm very anti kids even smoking one cigarette. Um, um, the whole Purim scene is a, is a tragic scene because they're introduced at 12, 13, they come to people's houses and they give them to drink and they think it's a big joke and they throw up all over the floor and everyone thinks it's great and they put them in limousines and they're smoking. And then you see, she was just thinking, yeah, give them a cigarette, a chassan cigarette, and alcohol. Listen very carefully. In our, in our head, in our psyche, it's, it's a metaphor, but you'll all understand what I'm saying. You have a road. You have a road. Now, when, you, when a kid takes his first drink, he gets a buzz. It's a feeling he never had. Most addictions, it's a feeling you never had, whether it's sexual, feeling, uh, sexual addiction or gambling, putting down $10 and winning 50. I never, I never, that never happened to me in my life. It's a new feeling. Now that creates a road in your psyche. The more times I go down the road, the more times I get that feeling, the more I travel on that road, the bigger the road gets. It's getting repaved and repaved, the lines are nice, getting repaved and repaved in my psyche. The reason that relapse, right, 30 day programs, <laughs> I think relapse probably 95%. Right? It just doesn't work. It just, you just need more time. But you, gotta, you have to save the kid's life. Three months, three months to a year to really, to really knock that relapse number down. Now, why do people relapse? Why is it so dangerous? Why do you have to go to AA for like 30 years? Why, the kid's clean for 10 years. Why do you got to keep going? Why do you have to have a sponsor? So this is the answer. So, I'm off drugs, I'm, I'm clean, 
I just got married, just have a kid, life is great. And then all of a sudden, I got fired from my job. My wife's yelling at me. Now, in my psyche, I am looking for a place to get out of my pain. The biggest road in my psyche was my marijuana or my heroin or whatever it was, right? Whatever my addiction is. So even though I'm a good guy and I went to rehab and I'm seeing a therapist and I have this big thing across the road that says, road closed. In Muncie, I used to live in Muncie, so every time they used to close my road, right, you had these orange little things, so, but I lived on the block. So I got to that, I took them, put them on the side, drove through, took them, put them back, and went to my house. Right, we do that in Borough Park all the time, right? Anyone who lives in Borough Park, 53rd Street, those kids, they always close 53rd Street. I gotta get to Shemesh Shabbos, because there's stoppers there. So they close this, these kids, they put these orange things. So I gotta get, I, I'm late, I gotta get there, right? So if there's no kids around, I park, I move the orange things, I pull up, I close it, bye, and I go to Shemesh Shabbos. It's the same thing in your psyche. That road is there. You closed it, okay. But I know what it feels like to do drugs because I did it, and I know what it feels like to gamble. And I'm not gonna get into the essence of all these different addictions, because they all come from a different place. Some guys gamble because they're just low yitzvah. They can't ever win. They're not social, but socially they don't do well. They never did well. well. Guess what? You can sit with a good hand in cards, and you can win. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be aggressive. You sit there, and you win, and poker, the addiction of poker, which is much bigger than blackjack, is in the game of poker. I don't want to teach you anything about gambling, but Rabbi Wallace, knows a lot about gambling. I'm 17 years clean, but boy, do I know a lot about gambling, okay? When you put your hands on all those chips, all those guys around the table, you look at them, I beat all of you, and you pull it to yourself. The feeling? is not normal. You could have been a loser in school. Nobody likes you. Nobody talks to you. You can't make a dollar. You're sitting at the table with those chips. You're the king. You're the melech malchei hamlach. <laughs> and you're clean. But then your life's falling apart. So where do you go back? Oh my goodness, I'm going to go back to drugs because that used to make me feel good. But the road's closed. <clears throat> One time's not going to make a difference. Move the pylons, get down the road. Relapse. So my whole thing is, if you don't have that road, then when you go back in your psyche and you're looking for that place to escape my pain, my wife, my pressure, my husband, my life, right? And you're looking, you're looking, there's no drug road. There's no sign, drug avenue. So you're gonna go to the place where you were safe, where you were safe, so it depends where you were safe. So my mother-in-law, who's a Holocaust survivor, who lost everybody on the march to Siberia from Poland, lost everybody. Her psyche as a little child, she held a little Tehillim and her mother said, whenever you're in pain, say Tehillim. So the road in her head, they didn't have drugs, the road in her head is when you're feeling depressed and you're feeling down and one of your grandchildren's not feeling well or you're nervous because one of them doesn't have a shidduch, what do you do? Tehillim, she says Tehillim, she's a Tehillim zugger. Why? Because the road in her psyche when I'm in pain, when things are not good, Tehillim Avenue. So when you let a kid drink once, you create a road. It's not an avenue yet, it's a street. But then when he is again in pain, or when something's going wrong, he takes another drink, and another drink, and the feeling gets more and more, and it becomes an avenue, and it becomes a turnpike, and it becomes a superhighway. And once it's a superhighway, it's an automatic, not thought process. Once it's a superhighway, it's an automatic reaction, pain, drink. There's no thinking, should I, pylons, closed, not closed. It becomes a superhighway. It's pain, drink, pain, drugs, trauma, drugs, drink, sexual, whatever it is, it's immediate. So I watch it, so what do you do? I don't have that road. I never did a drug in my life. Sorry. I don't talk to kids about drugs on that level because I don't know what it feels like. I was a hockey player and that was my addiction. I played sports over and over and over. Sports has crazy addiction because sports has adrenaline. When you take that shot and you win the game, I gambled. I won a lot of money. Uh -uh. It's, it's, a, it's a quick high. But winning in sports and you're the man, there's nothing like it. And most drug addicts that I deal with, my first question is, are you an athlete? 90% of them are not. 
Because if you're playing ball and you're one of the guys playing ball, you don't, you don't, drugs, they're just, just going to ruin you. Like, why would I do drugs? I won't be able to play. So I didn't have, I don't have that, I don't, I don't have that road. But I have other roads. I was a huge gambler. And I loved it. And I enjoyed it. And I told myself, I'm not a gambler. I'm not. Why? First of all, I used my own money. Never borrowed any money. And the Gemara says you're not allowed to gamble because if you gamble, the whole world's going to be destroyed. If everyone's going to gamble, then no one's going to plant farms and no one's going to do anything and we're all going to die. So you're not helping the world, number one. Number two, you're stealing. You gamble from a Jew. He doesn't want to give you the money. He doesn't want to lose. So you're stealing. He says, ha, ha, I'm going to AC. Those are Goyim. So I'm not stealing from a Jew. And I have a huge company, plastic bag company. I have hundreds of workers. So I'm just doing this as a, as a hobby. So the Gemara went out the door. We rationalize. That's the biggest thing that an addict does. We rationalize everything. In fact, I thought I was the biggest tzaddik that ever lived. Because I was a Jew, and I used to tip the dealer crazy money. So, ah! Oh, I thought, ah, oh, shit, no! They're not going to walk out of here thinking Jews are cheap. I'm a tzaddik! I was sitting in the casino thinking I'm a tzaddik. Rationalization, different one of my shiurim. So don't rationalize what they did. Everybody rationalized crazy things we rationalize. So how did I, how did I get out of it? 17, 18, I'm not interested. I have no interest whatsoever. I didn't go to GA. It's a kavayosha that got me out of it, actually. But separately, I have, no, I have no pull whatsoever to it. Do When I talk about my big wins and all the craziness that happened with my friends, do I smile? I'm like, wow, that was amazing. Yes, I didn't do full tshuva yet. Full tshuva, full tshuva, the Ramam says, is that when you remember it, it disgusts you. I can't say it disgusts me. I had some crazy stories. So when I'm talking to my friends, we're laughing. I'm like, you remember that? I should be saying, ugh, I hate it. But I'm not there yet. But I'm not going back. And I'm not worried about going back. Why? How do you fix that road? Kids are drug addicts. How do you fix that road? And the answer is, you got to build another one much bigger. Because you are going to go back there when you're in pain. And the biggest road is the one you're going to take. What's bigger than an addiction? What's bigger than, than winning a million dollars on one bet? When the, when, the, when the house has much better cars than you and you're like, oh my God, I just lost it. And they're like, no, you won. What's bigger? Wait, what kind of road are you going to build? A runway for an airplane? So this is the answer. And I tell it to all the kids that I work with. When you go through trauma, whatever, you, whatever, whatever you're going through and the reason that you're doing drugs or whatever you're doing, therapy helps. Therapy, in my opinion, doesn't cure. Thera therapy helps you cope. The pain is there. You cut my arm off. I don't have an arm. You're going to teach me how to use a fake arm. You're going to teach me how you're not, it's not the end of the world, right? Therapy helps coping. It gives you coping skills, and it helps you not go back there. Medicine? Medicine helps you cope. When you're off the medicine, you're back the way you were. So it didn't cure you. I've yet to come across a medicine that is actually cured bipolar. Because if you take the medicine away, the lithium and the medicines away, they're back to being bipolar. So medicine doesn't cure. Medicine and it gives you anesthesia so that when you're pulling my tooth out and I'm going through therapy and I'm opening up my trauma and all my stuff is coming out, I would, I, would, I would end up jumping off a bridge. But because I'm on medicine and you're mood stabilizing me, I am able to get the root canal. I could not go and get a root canal if you don't give me a shot because I'm going to jump off the chair. So medicine doesn't cure. The way you know something cures is when you stop it, the person's no longer what he was before. Medicine's very important because you can't do this trauma work. With a, with a kid who, who, who had terrible trauma and, and, and she should just be like regular and deal with it. So we give her medicine. What cures? There's one thing that takes that open wound and closes it, and I'm telling it to you from my experience, that closes the wound totally. I went through in third grade terrible terrible abuse. And then again in 10th grade. And the reason that I'm in Chinuch, and the reason there's an Arnava, and there's a re the reason that I have a ranch for kids, and now, Baruch Hashem, we just opened up 
um, a rehab for Jewish girls. We only have six beds in California. Why don't I stop? Everyone asks me, why don't you stop? You have Ornava, you have a high school, you have two seminaries, I have a business. That's, what, that's how I make my living. I have a family. Like, why don't you stop? I'm going to tell you why I don't stop. Because that trauma that happened to me in third grade, I've been coping with it. But it didn't get cured until I took that pain that I went through and I used it to help others. That is when you are cured. And I'll explain to you what I'm saying. And there are many therapists here, not here, many, many therapists, a lot of therapists, most therapists that I come across in addiction were addicts themselves. And they went through it, and now they want to help others that went through it because they felt that pain. But let me explain to you what I mean by cured. There's no way that Rabbi Wallace would be doing anything that he does if that didn't happen to me in third grade. I'm telling you right now, I'd be in business, I wouldn't be talking to you right now, I'd probably be in Miami laying on the beach because I was not interested. I was the least, the least expected kid in yeshiva to ever become a Rebbe or anything. And to this day, when I go to the dinner of my yeshiva, they look at me like, huh? Is that your brother or is that you? You know, we heard about this, we heard about that. Like, they, 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 it's like, the least. But when I went into 12th grade, I said to myself, I'm going to make sure I'm going to become a Rebbe. I was zero. I, I was a hockey player. I didn't learn a word. I was modern. I said, I'm going to become a Rebbe because I know that the 25 kids in my class, what happened to me is not happening to them. I will protect them. I taught eighth grade Kranite Yeshiva for 30 years times 25 kids. That's a lot of kids. For all of those who don't do the math, it's 750 kids. So what healed me is that I took my stuff, I call it, I talked to the girls about this, I talked to everyone about this very much. It's called struggle muscle. It's the muscle that you build by struggling. And with that muscle, you can carry others. If you don't have that muscle, you can't carry anybody. The more the muscle, the more you can carry. And Hashem came to me today, and he said to me, I'll let you live your life over again. You could skip third grade. I would tell him, no way. If I skip third grade, I'll never have Ornava, a terrace Nava, Benochaya, a terrace Miriam, a ranch, and all the kids that I helped in my life. I want third grade to happen again. When you're able to say that because of what I did with the pain that I went through, I want it to happen again, what happened in third grade is no longer negative. It now became a positive. Because because of what happened in third grade, I became who I am and I do what I did, then I want it again if I have to go through it, I need it. So I'm no longer looking at that rabbi in third grade, I'm not looking at it as trauma. Yes, you're going to get, the rabbi's going to get whatever he needs to get. That's not my business. But it became something positive in my life. The wound is closed. I'm not coping with pain. There's no more pain. Just the opposite. It's like if he would have done what he'd done a few more times, maybe I'd open up another 10 yeshivas. <laughs> it's such a change. So when I talk to addicts, I'm like, there's only one way to change that road of heroin or sexual things or, or drinking or whatever, or gambling. And that is we have to build such a huge highway that when you go back, you're going to be, why should I go into a, high, a road that's full of holes and bumps and unsafe when I have this super highway that was just paved? the highway of helping others, and those other people who don't relapse. You have to replace the addiction. So I no longer need the flip of a card. It's much more exciting to save a girl, to save a boy's life. That beats any addiction in the world. You have to replace the addiction. And that is the only way that you can cure it. You can, you can give them coping skills, 
but that's the only way that you can cure it. And we learn this from the Torah. I'll close with this. Yosef HaTzadik, I talk about him all the time. You want trauma? Torah is full of trauma. Any trauma that anyone in this room ever heard of happened in the Torah. Abuse, you know what Dina went through? And she became pregnant from it. People losing children in the first two, three books. Adam loses Hevel. Aaron loses Nadav Ve'avihu. Yehuda loses Erva Onan. Yaakov loses Rachel when she's very young. Yaakov's son is kidnapped. Moshe Rabbeinu has a learning disability. He can't talk. He's abandoned. He's adopted. He goes far away to help Yisrael's kids. He puts them in prison. Unappreciated it. Never said thank you to him. We're, we're, what, in this, what in the Torah do you see that there's no trauma? The Torah is so full of trauma. It's not normal. A woman, we have uh, Bone Olam. We have Eitaim. Sorry, Meno didn't have bone albums eight times. 90 years old! Every month, 90 years old, no kid! And she turned to Abraham and said, you, You're able to heal everyone, you can't heal me. And what did Rachel say to Yaakov? What? You give everyone a child, but you can't give me? They went through a lot of trauma. Yosef had tzaddik. They stripped him, threw him into a bar. He should get bitten to death by snakes. Then they pull him out. Okay, listen, a miracle. It must be a good boy. No, we're going to sell you down to Mitzrayim. Potiphar's wife. Then he's in the dungeon. What a life. Look at the end. We're ending with this, because this is my whole speech today. Look at the end. I don't have a chumash in front of me. A is by Yechi. And his brothers say to him, our father died. You're going to take revenge, aren't you? You're going to take revenge. That road of what we did to you. That road is in your psyche. You're not going to let us get away with this. And this is what he answered. He said, no. I got a bigger road. You see, if it all had to happen over again, I'd want it to happen over again. Because you think you hurt me. Hashem wanted this to happen so that I could save the world. And once Yosef realized that the trauma he went through, even though it was so negative, was not negative, because only because of that trauma he was able to save the world, he said, guys, we're good. No trauma, no pain. We're brothers. You guys didn't even do anything. You didn't even do anything, Rebbe, in third grade. You think you did something? God knew there needs to be an Arnava. You thought it was you? Ah! I had to do what I had to do, Yosef said. It's a good thing I was sold to a tribe. Look at the passage. It's a good thing I saved the world. It's all in the Torah, everybody. It's all in the Torah. So that's what you got to give over to, to your patients, to the kids, to everybody, to yourselves, to ourselves. And that is, we all have roads in our psyche. Some dysfunctional homes, some divorces, just so many roads in a person's emotional psyche. And there are triggers, as you know. There are many triggers. And what a trigger means is that in, in psychological terms, you call it a trigger, but what it really means is that whatever you just said sent them back to that road in their psyche. That's what it means to trigger. You put me back on that road. I closed that road. Forgot the word. It's called transference. One of the... I read this in Time Magazine about transference. There was this woman, or tran I don't know, not transference, a different word? Transfer. What? Transfer. Okay. Sorry, I'm not, I'm listening, I'm not, uh, not yet anyway. So they wrote this story that I think she was a CEO of Ford or one of these huge companies, and they had this big meeting, and she was sitting at the head of the table, and everybody was sitting down, and this guy walked in, right? She's a CEO, an older woman. And this guy walks in, and he's wearing a bright red tie. And she's sitting in her chair, and he walks in. And when he walks in, she goes like that in her chair, like a whole defensive type of posture. You're talking about the head of one of the biggest companies in the United States. And everybody in the room's like, what? And then she's, she's like shaking, and then she calms down, and they have the whole meeting. When the meeting's over, her assistant says to her, what was that? She said, my father used to sexually abuse me. 
And every time he walked into the room, he was wearing a red, bright tie. So when he walked in, I saw my father coming to attack me. Transference, whatever you call it, transference, transference. So that's a trigger. Those roads in her mind, when her father's wearing a red tie, that's a road that's there. And therefore, when I see that tie, I'm back on that road. And that road is such a terrible road. It goes off a cliff. And there's so many roads in these kids' souls and, and minds that are going off cliffs. And how do we stop them from going back to those roads? And the answer is, as therapists, as rabbis, as parents, as people who care, we need to build a huge road that he doesn't go there. That he goes to that huge road like my mother-in-law goes to Tehillim. He goes to that huge road, and the, the, you, the biggest road is when you take your stuff and you use it to help others. That's when your road gets bigger. So I'm leaving this place, and I'm going up to Westchester to visit a bunch of Jewish kids that are in the psych ward. That's a lot better than going south to Atlantic City. There, there's no comparison. So, yeah, that road to Atlantic City is, is closed. They put some concrete in the way, too. That's what we need to do for ourselves and for our kids. When you sit there and you're talking to this kid, you need to figure out what they're good at, and you need to build a beautiful, amazing highway in their mind. And they will not relapse, because when they go back, that's the first road in their psyche. May we all be zaycha to get that big highway to Eretz Yisrael, to the base of Migdash, to Yerushalayim. Him here be amen, amen. Thank you. The Roar Jewish Learning Institute has the largest collection of Jewish media online. Hit subscribe for more.